Okay, everybody, we're, as, as is our want in this province, we start on time, right? Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you David Shribman, but before I do, I want to point out to people who are from Edwards or other places on campus that we're right now in the middle of Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. And Johnson Shoyama is a unique um, arrangement between University of Regina, Hi, Regina. See, yes. Hi. So, for people who who haven't seen this kind of thing done before, this is very common at this graduate school that there are joint classes and there's teleconferencing, um, and so there is another city watching this this uh, lecture as well. So that's a unique feature. Um, this is part of a dean's speaker series, which is not really a series, but a series of opportunistic responses to the idea of bringing in high stature people who have never spent time in Saskatchewan to get used to us and for us to see what's going on in the, in the larger <laughs> world. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you David Shribman, who is executive editor and vice president of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Mr. Shribman was national political correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, covered Congress and national politics for the New York Times, and was a member of the national staff of the Washington Star. He received the Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for his coverage of American political scene in 1994. So you can ask him all kinds of questions about, I guess, the religiosity of American presidents and you know, all the, the articles that one would have had to write in order to win a Pulitzer Prize. He writes a weekly national syndicated column, My Point, and a bi-weekly column for the Globe and Mail. Some of you might recognize him because he's a frequent analyst for BBC, CBC, has served on, on panels on, is it Face the Nation or Face the Nation on, on US News, and has lectured at universities and colleges around the country, including Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, <laughs> Brandeis, Virginia Commonwealth, Gettysburg College, and is here now with us, and we've had a heck of a last day or so, and um, he's just written a column, rather, on whether Kennedy called Diefenbaker an SOB or not. <laughs> and this man also, it's not in his columns, um, has just opened a Canadian passport, so he's a binational and has a total fascination for things Canadian. So is sort of a vacuum suction machine for things Canadian. So now that we all know you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you Regina also. Um, I, I hung around this building a little bit this morning and uh, I was interested in, in Diefenbaker uh, because the hero of your hometown and the hero of my hometown, I grew up in Boston, uh, had a celebrated clash in uh, about 50 years ago. And I thought we talked, before we talk about the uh, subject at hand, I thought I would go through that a little bit and uh, I'd be happy to be stand, to have, uh, stand corrected if I have any of this wrong. But these were two men with completely different outlooks. They had almost nothing in common. One was a gruff populist carrying the dust of the prairie and the other was a shimmery political presence marked by the stardust of celebrity. One was the 105th Saskatoon Fusilier veteran of World War II, the other a PT-109 veteran of World War II, the other one of World War I. One was Northwest Territories Rural, the other Boston Urbane. One was Canadian Baptist, the other Roman Catholic. One began his career in a tiny crossroads in Saskatchewan, population 400, the other in the U.S. House of Representatives, population 435. <laughs> John G. Diefenbaker and John F. Kennedy were separated by a lot more than simply the 49th parallel. The Canadian Prime Minister and the American President clashed almost nonstop in the early 1960s until Diefenbaker's ouster from power 52 years ago next month. Since then, American leaders and their Canadian counterparts certainly have had there are moments of friction. Lyndon Johnson once physically manhandled Lester Pearson, and Richard Nixon described Pierre Elliott Trudeau as a pompous egghead. But little compares with the deep enmity that Kennedy felt toward Diefenbaker and the raw resentment that Diefenbaker returned to Kennedy. Diefenbaker, as you know, three times 
led the Tories to election victories. He enjoyed a congenial relationship with Dwight Eisenhower, who was the president before Kennedy. Perhaps this was because Eisenhower had great respect for the courage of Canadian troops on D-Day, and because he was involved in two signal achievements involving both countries, the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway and the establishment of the distant early warning line, the Dew Line, to signal both countries of a Soviet attack. So Diefenbaker's Baker's rea uh, relationship with Kennedy was another thing entirely. No one knows exactly why the two hated each other so much, but a picture emerges from contemporary accounts and later memoirs, including Deef's himself. This much is known. The two guys met in Washington a month after Kennedy's inauguration in January 61. Diefenbaker, no patsy when it came to relations with his southern neighbor, paused before an op uh, Oval Office display of, war of War of 1812 battles and noted to Kennedy that the Americans hadn't won all the confrontations at sea in that war. He would have loved the exhibit a few doors down here. Uh, that may have been the only occasion in the past 200 years that the 1813 encounter between the Chesapeake and the British frigate Shannon has been a point of contention in the White House. Nonetheless, when Kennedy visited Ottawa in May of that year, the visit did not go well, not at all. And in fact, there's a very, very good account of it in the museum there. The president came armed with a memo setting forth what we want from the Ottawa trip. This was not the way Diefenbaker liked to do business. One of the now largely forgotten five demands was more aid to India. When Diefenbaker, who once said he wasn't anti-American but pro-Canadian, was handed the list of what the president wanted, the prime minister fixed a bold no with a gold pencil to every one of the entries. That afternoon, Kennedy spoke before the Canadian Parliament and issued perhaps the most soaring celebration of the Canadian-American relationship ever, words that are quoted all the time, you've heard them a hundred times, in ceremonial events on both sides of the border. Geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends. But friendship sometimes, as you know, are perilous, and the President's what we want from Ottawa memo was somehow left behind in Ottawa. And Diefenbaker says this in his memoirs. The president apparently dropped it into my wastepaper basket at the end of the meeting. In the memo's margins, members of the prime minister staff thought they could make out in Kennedy's handwriting, S-O-B, <laughs> meant as a description of Mr. Diefenbaker himself. But in these 18, 1984 memoir, Ben Bradley, the, uh, later the um, Washington Post editor, uh, said, the president told me he did not write S-O-B. In his reminiscence of the Kennedy years, Kennedy's speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, speculated the letters might really have been OAS, which is about as potent an um, international organization as the NHL. <laughs> In any case, what might have been just as incendiary was language on the document saying the Kennedy visit was designed to push the Canadians into agreement. Uh, this is um, Diefenbaker himself. I could not understand the President of the United States coming to Ottawa to push us into anything. Nor could Diefenbaker countenance Kennedy's invitation to Lester Pearson, his Liberal Party rival and successor, to a White House reception for the 1961 Nobel Prize winners. The President's motivation in provoking Diefenbaker? No mystery. Jack just didn't, much, didn't think much of him, said Ben Bradley. That's why when Kennedy denied that he had written SOB about the Prime Minister, he explained that he didn't know that quite that early that Stephen Baker, in fact, was an SOB. <laughs> so let's get to the topic of hand, which is why you, uh, you don't understand American politics anymore and why they don't either. Regina, can you hear me? Well, which mic is not? Uh, wave if you can hear me. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so here are some names that you may or may not know. Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, and Ted Cruz. They are freshman senators, Republicans from Florida, Kentucky, and Texas. They're virtual unknowns outside political circles, but already potential presidential candidates. Ted Cruz, in fact, was born in Alberta. In the next couple of months, they'll create headlines by pronouncing themselves ready to be the chief executive of the greatest power on earth. And in fact, Ted Cruz did that just last week. If any of these men were elected, he would have less than one term in the United States Senate. Now, you might think of them as drive-by senators, 
presumptuous in believing themselves qualified for the top office, except that their 70 months in the Senate will be more than 50 percent longer than the amount of time Barack Obama spent in the Senate before being elected to the White House. All of which raises an important question. What does it take to be ready or to be qualified to be the President of the United States? Here are some people who, by ordinary reckoning, were ready to be President of the United States. Here are a bunch of them. Senator Robert J. Dole of Kansas, a disabled World War II veteran who was in Congress for more than a third of a century. He lost the 1966 ele 1996 election. Here's another one. Senator John McCain of Arizona, a celebrated Vietnam prisoner of war who served on Capitol Hill for a quarter of a century before he won the Republican nomination in 2008. He lost the election to Mr. Obama. Here's a third. Albert Gore Jr., a Vietnam veteran also, son of a senator, served in the House and the Senate, and is an unusually activist vice president for eight years. He lost the 2000 election. And one more. Walter F. Mondale, who was a state attorney general, a senator, and a vice president. In 1974, he made the extraordinary remark that he wasn't ready to be president, regarded then as now as a com comment of unusual probity and maturity. He spent the time between the end of his vice presidency and the 84 election campaign studying up on all the vital issues of his time. And he once, I, I heard this story myself, he once emerged from his Minneapolis law office to announce to an astonishing colleague, I finally understand the Federal Reserve. And if I understood it, I would explain it to you. <laughs> on the day he declared his candidacy for the White House, he proclaimed, I am ready to be president. By any reasonable measure, he was. He lost 49 states. In the post-war period, only three presidents have been indisputably qualified in the traditional way to hold the office they won. One was Dwight Eisenhower, pal of Diefenbaker, who commanded Allied forces in Europe. A dozen generals have become president. And he had served as an Ivy League university president at Columbia. Another was Richard Nixon, one of your favorites, I'm sure, who served in the House, Senate, and was vice president for two tumultuous <coughs> terms. And he still was defeated in 1960 by a candidate regarded as even more unqualified, John F. Kennedy. But he eventually rebounded to win the White House eight years later. And the third utterly qualified president was George H.W. Bush, who served in the House, was chairman of the Republican National Committee, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, chief U.S. diplomat, both in Beijing and at the United States, United Nations, and then was a two-term two -term vice president. All the rest of the presidents have been political gambles made by the American people, including Lincoln. Kennedy, in fact, was, and here's a new concept, among the least unqualified presidents of the period, a World War II veteran with six years in the House, eight in the Senate, but a very slim record on Capitol Hill. He writes, he rates a slight advantage by virtue of his slender foreign policy experience over four governors with no foreign policy experience whatsoever. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. The truth is that there is no formula for presidential success or even for presidential electability. No major American political party in recent history has nominated a leader remotely like Canada's Michael Ignatieff, whose native roots had been severed by time abroad and whose Liberal Party effort was defeated three, three years ago. But the United States has been reasonably open, remarkably open, to political outsiders. In fact, since Watergate, it's given special favor to outsiders. But these outsiders often have been governors who, and here Mr. Reagan and Mr. Clinton, both leaders of the Sun Belt states, come to mind, governors who luxuriated and often exaggerated their outsider status. Reagan was a conservative in a party that had repeatedly nominated moderates. Clinton was a moderate in a party that repeatedly had nominated liberals. Though there have been very few advantages given to insiders. Gerald Ford, appointed but not elected president, after Nixon resigned in 1974, was the ultimate insider. A quarter century on Capitol Hill and Republican leadership credentials, he was defeated by Mr. Carter. One of the reasons surely was his pardon of Nixon after Watergate, but Mr. Carter's status as a fresh face was a major factor. Indeed, the number of senators elected to the White House is small, only 16. And the number who have moved directly from the Senate to the presidency is minuscule, three. Warren Harding, Jack Kennedy, Barack Obama. Together, the, group, the record of that group, Harding, Kennedy, and, Bo and Obama, 
is modest at best. The recent governor's turn president at least boasts executive experience, a background Mr. Obama lacks, and one which might explain some of the troubles he's had in his presidency. And almost every student of the presidency says that what really matters in the Oval Office, along with intelligence and integrity, is personality and perspective. Kennedy had all of that, Carter, none of it. The late presidential analyst Richard Neustadt, who was a great friend of mine, was famous for saying that presidential power is the power to persuade. In his classic 1960 work, Presidential Power, Richard Neustadt argued that a president, quote, makes his personal impact by the things he says and does. He often added privately that the way he says and does things matter also. So the verdict on Barack Obama is still out, but he remains more promise than performance. So Mr. Rubio and uh, Mr. Cruz and some of his other amateur presidential rivals are more in the main current of American political life than you generally might recognize. Two other freshman senators, Ted Cruz, I mentioned earlier, and Rand Paul, both Republicans are regarded as legitimate presidential candidates. So are four governors, Republicans Bobby Jindal of Louisiana, Mike Pence of Indiana, Rick Perry of Texas, Democrat Martin O'Malley of Maryland. None of you have ever heard of any of them. Neither have most Americans. Most Americans outside the states couldn't identify them. But then again, how many Americans had heard of Barack Obama? And he's the 44th president of the United States. And the answer to a trivia question, no longer. One of the reasons is that in both parties, but most especially in the Republican Party, there is no establishment anymore. In fact, let me ask a startling question. Is it part possible that in the party of the establishment, there is no party establishment anymore? That in the caucus of the old guard, no one is on guard. That's the Republican question of the moment, the question that dares not speak its name, one that suggests that the character of a political party more than a century and a half old has shifted startlingly, startlingly, significantly in the past decade or two. The Republicans seem to be avoiding this question, speaking obliquely of a party establishment but never identifying its members or even its inclinations. Three years ago, Newt Gingrich, who was, was a former House Speaker, and would ordinarily be regarded as a charter member of the establishment, plainly ran for president against the establishment. The establishment is right to be worried about a Gingrich nomination, he said on Meet the Press. We're going to make the establishment very uncomfortable. But here's the secret. There's no establishment to make uncomfortable anymore or to make things right in a party that seems to be hungry for someone, something, or anything to make things right, or at least to make things clear. Now, ordinarily, former Presidents would be establishment figures, but one of them, H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, is frail and is to the new warriors of the GOP a symbol of easy compromise. And the other, George W. Bush, is still politically radioactive. <laughs> if there's a Republican establishment left, it con consists of the times when Robert Dole eats alone. The other members of the establishment are long dead, and Mr. Dole is 91. He hasn't been in office for 18 years. None of the other figures qualifies as a party leader whose word might make mortals tremble, or whose dictates might carry the voltage of a thunderbolt. I have all these uh, electrical images because I just went over to the Canadian light uh, uh, spectrometer or whatever it is. <laughs> the Republicans have had such figures in the past decades. Dwight Eisenhower, Thomas Dewey, Richard Nixon, House Majority Leader Charlie Halleck, Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen, former House Speaker Joseph Martin. But the Republicans have none of those anymore. Today, neither the Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell nor the House Speaker John Boehner can play that role. Neither can speak for his entire caucus or for the entire party. Both are worried about the influence of the Tea Party in their respective houses. It may be that the modern Republican establishment has, relegate, has been relegated to the presence of a few rotary clubs in cities with population under 100,000. But the Republicans aren't alone. Six and a half years ago, the insurgent Democratic candidate, Barack Obama, defeated the establishment ca candidate, Hillary Clinton, who had the support of a former president, big labor, and almost all the liberal interest groups. Usually, the president of the United States automatically is regarded as an establishment figure. But Mr. Obama himself shirks from that role. And as a recent account of life within the first family suggests, he's uncomfortable with many of the rituals of political life, like sitting around after hours with people he hates, 
and assuring them how much he likes them. <laughs> but a party that has specialized in toppling the powerful, as the Democrats did until recently, doesn't need an establishment as much as one that, until recent decades, practiced a conservatism of the old definition, which was resistance to change. That is why, in the past, Republicans selected nominees such as Tom Dewey, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, the elder Mr. Bush, and Mr. Dole, all with conventional credentials and all with presidential campaigns, and three of them with vice presidential campaigns behind them. That Republican craving for safety and stability is firmly in the past, which is why the safest and probably least unpredictable among the GOP contenders, Jeb Bush, will almost certainly seek to minimize the very establishment credentials that in 1960 or 1968 would have assured him of nomination, probably without breaking a sweat, which is the way establishment politicians like to do things. Former uh, Reagan White House Chief of Staff Ken Duberstein told me this. The Republicans have become much more of a grassroots party than a grass tops party. The group has really sh ground has really shifted ever since the Republicans lost the presidency. And that's the whole point. In the old days, the Republicans, who were the grounded one in our politics, won votes because they helped keep the ground from shifting. Here's another example of how American politics have shifted. A lot of qualified people no longer want to be in the Senate, the world's most exclusive club. It's actually called that, though many describe it as the cave of winds, especially the people who are there now. Of all the institutions in American life, the Senate once seemed the sturdiest. Fortified with rules written by Thomas Jefferson, animated by an 18th century Enlightenment outlook, protected by a generous sense of tenure, it had charm and stability and seemed impervious to change. Within its walls, and I covered the Senate for more than a decade, I can tell you this is true. Within its walls, time stood still, in part because the traditions of the Senate defied time, because the rules of the Senate suspended time, because time could not dim the history from Webster to Calhoun to Baker Dolan, three candidates that was made within those walls. I had such respect for the institution itself and the very large figures who inhabited it, many of whom I admired from afar, said Senator uh, Gary Hart, a Colorado Democrat who served from 17, 1975 to 1987. Then not one time in 12 years did I enter the chamber without being keenly aware that I was inheriting national history and making it at the same time. All that was true. And all that may be true again, but it's not true now, with senators abandoning the chamber like passengers fleeing an ocean liner on fire. No one today would agree with Gladstone's assessment that the Senate was the most remarkable of all the inventions of modern politics. Senators from another time regard their years in the chamber as among the richest, most rewarding in their lives, almost universally. They speak wistfully, nostalgically, almost romantically about their time there. Yet these days in the, the Senate is a wretched place. There's partisanship, which always existed, but in the past was much more muted. There's a lack of comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y, a favorite Senate word when there actually was some. There's a lack of respect from the public, which once regarded the, the Senate as the upper house, even though longtime members of the House never bought that theory. There's also a lack of a sense of accomplishment, mostly because the Senate doesn't accomplish anything at all. In short, it's a lousy job with very little satisfaction because the Senate's work is consumed with routine filibusters, indefinite holds on legislation and nominations, straight party votes dictated by leaders who watch helplessly as the chamber lurches from crisis to crisis. Here are some figures that make the case. 20 years ago, the Senate held 395 roll call votes. In 2013, it held 251. Two decades ago, it ratified 20 treaties. Last year, it ratified none. Now, it's perfectly, perfectly plausible to argue that a Congress that passes less legislation is a better Congress. And in a world where the country would do well to tend to its own knitting, the reduction of ratified treaties from 20 to zero could be a good thing. But few people, Republicans or Democrats, go to the Capitol with the hope of doing nothing. And few lawmakers, even in the age of the Tea Party, go to Washington with a stated <laughs> intent of preventing legislation rather than promoting it. Now consider two similarly situated sessions of Congress. The second session of the 112th that ended two years ago, and the second session of the 106th that ended in 2000. The Senate in the second session of the 106th sent 131 laws to the books. The 112th sent 42. The situation is so bad, there's so little to do in the Senate, that lawmakers who once were members of the House 
now often cross this capital to pass the time with their former colleagues. A year ago or two, Senator Saxby Chambliss of Georgia, who was 69 and whose two terms in the Senate followed four uh, in the House, stunned Washington by announced he wouldn't seek another term. Just the other day, Harry Reid, who's the uh, Senate Minority Reader, Leader, said the same thing. But Mr. Chambliss was just the sort of guy who in another era might have been counted for a long career. His service in the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, his cha chairmanship of the Intelligence and Homeland Security Subcommittee went along, along with his status as the ranking Republican of the Senate Intelligence Committee, set him up to become a big guy on Capitol Hill. Instead, he decided to leave. But lawmakers still find profound frustration, and they don't feel they're surrounded by what Gary Hart called large-scale figures. He listed some colleagues by last name only, knowing that he served at a time when the Senate surnames sufficed. Mansfield, Humphrey, Muskie, Nelson, Church, Matthias, Javits, Case, Stennis, Goldwater. Some of these are even known to you. They're all gone. Every one of them is gone. All gone, and along with them, something special in American life. Now let's get to the nub of the matter. If you're looking for someone to blame for the polarized nat nature of American politics, here are two nominees, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the political sci uh, science establishment. Together, they set out the argument for the situation we have in Washington today, a Republican uh, party loaded with conservatives and a Democratic party larded with liberals and few in between. The result has been gridlock, rancor, and a sense of despair, if not hopelessness, in the capital and across the country. We have a political landscape where it's possible to argue that the most conservative Democrats in Congress are more liberal than the most liberal Republicans. There's no overlap, as there used to be. No real party dissenters. None of the sort who were unacceptable to FDR, who wanted a party of ideological purity, and who were inexplicable to political scientists, who look longingly at the ideologically dim, uh, disciplined parties here in Canada, in Europe, and wondered why American parties so defied logic. But today, FDR and the political science establishment have had their way. The United States has its most ideologically aligned party system in modern history, and perhaps the biggest political crisis in modern history. Now, party caucuses always have reinforced party discipline. But for the time, first time, both caucuses are enforcing ideological discipline as well. In the course of their work, lawmakers almost never encounter views that depart from their own. They almost never form friendships with their political adversaries. If they don't practice ideological compromise inside their own parties, they're less likely and less able to practice it on the floor of both houses of Congress. So the lack of a middle in American political class, in the American political class, is the current American problem. The irony is that the American problem repeatedly has been held up as the American solution. The most prominent advocate for ideologically aligned parties was Franklin Roosevelt, who once told Samuel Rosenman, a White House speechwriter and the first White House counsel, we ought to have two real parties, a liberal party and a conservative party. So FDR set out to create just that. He tried to purge conservatives and New Deal foes from the Democratic Party. He singled out, among others, Walter George of, of uh, Georgia, Ellis uh, Cotton Ed Smith of South Carolina, Millard Tidings of Maryland, all of whom prevailed against the onslaught of White House opposition. Susan Dunn, who was a William College historian, who's written the definitive account of the Roosevelt Offensive, said the president's biggest blunder, quote, was to undertake the purge in the absence of impressive challenges to conservative incumbents. That's probably true. But for whatever reason, the mushy party system prevailed and had unforeseen consequences even for Roosevelt. Many of the most ardent opponents of the New Deal turned out to be the most ardent supporters of the president's initiatives on foreign affairs, supporting Roosevelt on Lend-Lease, so much so that the party alignment was doomed as World War II approached. Now, this notion of ideological parties gained a new life a dozen years later when the American Political Science Review published a landmark article called Toward a More Responsible Two-Party System, which argued that American parties needed sufficient internal cohesion and a degree of unity within the parties that they lacked at mid-century. At the time, the Democratic Party had such conservatives as Harry F. Byrd of Virginia and Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina and a whole bunch of Southern Committee chairmen. The Republicans had liberals such as Governor Earl Warren of California, Representative Clifford Case of New Jersey, and Senator Henry Cabot Laws, Jr. 
of Massachusetts. The political scientist's report echoed scholarly critiques dating back a half century with important people like Woodrow Wilson, who was a political scientist, and Herbert Crowley, an important thinker in the progressive era and the co-founder of the New Republic, raised questions about why we had such a lousy party system. Our Austin Ranney, who was then a political scientist at the University of Illinois and later a chairman of political science at Berkeley, wrote in a contemporary critique of the 1950 report this. However one may deplore that system, he must concede that it has displayed, if nothing else, a very impressive ability to survive. One reason that old system survived for so long is the multiplicity of interests and ideal, uh, ideologies inside American parties. That, that imposed all sorts of restraints on the majority that Americans liked, much like the checks and balances and the separation of powers designed in the Constitution, all for, to protect the rights and, and viewpoints of the minority. Now we have just the kind of political system Roosevelt and the political scientists envision. We're living the future. It does not work. Larry Bartels, the co-director of the Vanderbilt University Center of the Study of, Inst of Democratic Institutions, says this. When the political scientists were thinking about these things in the 50s, they were focusing on the good things the more responsible party system might bring. Now that we're living it, we're seeing a lot of the bad things. Now political scientists are wringing their hands about the negative implications of polarization. In Washington in 2015, every Republican member of the Senate is to the right of every Democratic member of the Senate, and every House Republican is to the right of every Democratic House member. It's important, in an important retrospective of the 1950 political scientist report, on its 50th anniversary, UCLA political scientist Barbara Sinclair argued that the modern parties do not represent a clearer political message than they did 50 years ago. She's right. If an American votes for a Republican today, she's very likely voting for a conservative. And if she votes for a Democrat, she's very likely voting for a liberal. That's clear. One other thing is also clear. The political science, the political system is a lot worse off than it used to be. That's it. So um, that's a lot to digest. And I'm, we have a lot of time. And I'd be very uh, delighted to uh, take questions from Regina or from here. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, and if they're really hard to evade them, my guess is that uh, uh, we'll have a lively discussion. Great. Thank you.